What's going on you guys? Paul here with Paul's Performance and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I have a very special one for you 6.0 guys. I have a 6.0 that will not start. This is day to day for you 6.0, nothing new. I should know I own 6.0s. I see a lot of 6.0s. Just about the most common issue that you see out of a 6.0 is that it will not start. A lot of times it starts out as it will not start hot, but like I said, you get ones where they won't start at all. Like this one, this one is a no start cold or hot. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you guys what I go through when I get a 6.0 that will not start. Everything I'm looking for diagnostic wise to see if it can tell me where my reason is. Show you what needs to happen on this truck for it to start. It's really only a couple things that, that it really needs to be able to start. I'm not going to go into 100% depth as far as like, you know, checking starter wiring and all that. Obviously, this, the truck needs to turn over. If your truck's not turning over, you're going to be in other issues. This is for a truck that just will not start. So we're going to go through that and I'm going to try to get all of the hot points, the most common stuff that, that I see. Anyways, let's get inside the truck and we're going to see what's going on. One pro point to this truck, which this is a guy I've worked on this truck quite a bit. He has a scan gauge in here. A scan gauge is an excellent device to have really any vehicle because it works for most vehicles I've used. It's worked on. You can get them at Advance Auto is where I've seen them locally or order them online. They're not that expensive. I think they're like 150 bucks, which I know is not cheap, but comparative to a scan tool, which is four thousand dollars it is cheap and it does a lot of the stuff you need it reads four pibs at one time it'll read codes and all types of stuff like that it's a really good tool to have and if you have a 6.0 it's pretty much you need it because you're gonna have an issue with it eventually he has a scan gauge so i don't really need to pull out my scan tool yet to look at anything because the scan gauge is going to give me the information that i need so what we're going to do is on here he already has icp injection control pressure pulled up he has the ipr valve percentage pulled up 48 volts or 58 volts uh, you may see somewhere in between 48 and 58 for some of these weird aftermarket uh, thickums but yeah it should never drop more than two or three volts lower than what your thickum is rated at if you see anything lower than that then your thickum could be the issue i would go ahead and plan on swapping that out we have icp and ipr pulled up so we're going to try starting it while looking at that your icp should go to 500 psi and once it hits that the truck should start we're going to turn it over right quick All right, guys, so as you can see, our ICP is low. We're not getting the 500 PSI that we're needing to fire the truck off for the injectors to start operating. That's likely gonna be where our problem is. I am gonna go over a couple more things that you would look out for just in the event that you are getting that pressure. Another thing that I like to look at is Fickham sync, which is your sync between your uh, crank and cam sensors. That's another PID that I would look at to let you know that you know those two sensors are operating properly because if, that, if you have that sync, It'll just go, usually the PID will say yes or no. Once you get yes, that's gonna tell you, hey, boom, you have both of those sensors working. So that's another thing that I like to look at, but not as common. Our ICP is not as high and our IPR is going to 84%, which is fully closed for the IPR valve. It's trying its best to build the pressure by closing it fully. You shouldn't have any issue getting to 500 PSI on a you know non-leaking system. It showed zero for quite a bit and then it went up to about 300 and some change. But like I said, still not enough to fire off the injectors. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to rule out the ICP sensor. If the ICP sensor is bad and reading the wrong reading, it won't start because it's reading 300 you know, PSI right now or whatever it's reading. Or in your case, it could be reading anything else or it could just be reading zero. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the hood and unplug the sensor, which will default the sensor to a PSI that would start the truck. So we're gonna unplug it, come back, crank the truck, see if the truck runs. If the truck does crank up, then you know your ICP sensor is bad and is giving a false reading. If the truck still doesn't start, then it kind of rules out your, your sensor and tells you there's still something else wrong with the truck. But this is a quick test I like to tell people to do, especially if they call me and they're broke down, just because the ICP sensor can cause this issue. So we're gonna unplug it, see what happens. For those of you who have a late 04 through uh, 07, or if you have any con line, I think those go up past the year 2007. But if you have a 6.0 that's 04 and a half and up, your ICP sensor is gonna be located on this passenger side valve cover right here where my hand is. And we're just gonna pop that plug off and 
that's it. If you have a 03 to early 04 60 truck, I apologize to you because your sensor is not gonna be in this location. It's gonna be back behind the turbo. And I just wanna apologize to you in advance for owning one of those. Those year models, 60s really do suck. Um, but yeah, that sensor will be back there. You can unplug it. You're gonna have a little bit harder time, but like I said, different location. So now we're gonna go back to the truck, turn it over and see if the truck starts and go from there. So as you can see with the sensor unplugged, the computer is going to default the reading for that sensor. As you can see from the scan gauge, it defaulted it to like 1,322. That reading will kind of vary, but it's gonna default it to a reading that the truck would run on. That's just the way that the truck's designed for if the sensor fails or it no longer gets the reading, it'll default to a reading that it can run on. It won't run well, but it will run. As you can see, IPR was reading like 59 and that was reading 1,300, which should have started the truck if it was mechanically building the pressure but it's not mechanically building the pressure because like i said with the computer receiving that signal it still didn't start so that tells you the mechanical it's it's actually not building the pressure so it's probably not the sensor so now what we're going to do hook the sensor back up and we're going to have to look into the high pressure oil system and figure out where our leak is and i'm going to show you guys what i use to pressure check that and try to see if i can't verify where the leak's coming from because like i said it could be coming from a lot of different places. It could be under either of the valve covers at injectors, oil rails, the most common, which is stand pipes. It could also be coming from behind the turbo at the pump, at the high pressure pump. This is an early high pressure pump, so it doesn't have the STC fitting on it. And I already know that this truck right here, the high pressure oil pump actually come apart in this. We put a diesel site billet pump in there. So I highly doubt that we're gonna have any issues with the pump being it has such a good pump in it. The most likely thing that I'm gonna be thinking of is standpipes. That's the most common. And here lately, I've seemed to have a little bit of issues with standpipes, even new ones. This is the first time ever I've had a brand new set of Ford standpipe O-rings actually fail. I had it fail on another truck. So I'm not sure what Ford's doing with that. Uh, for those of you 60 guys, mechanics or work on these, let me know if you guys have had some issues here lately with brand new motorcraft parts. For the truck that I had, I put a brand new set of Ford Motocraft straight from the dealer stand pipes on that truck and it lasted about a month and it blew out one of the lower uh, O-rings. So I ended up putting an Alliant Power set of O-rings back on those stand pipes and I haven't heard from him. I mean, that was, that's been a while. It was very weird to me because like I said, I've, I work on a lot of 6 O's and like I said, those those O-rings are very finicky for those of you guys. Um, you can install them wrong. If you're installing the O-rings, just the O-rings on the pipes you can't just put those o-rings on the pipes and instantly install them into the truck you have to give at least an hour to allow for those o-rings to unexpand down and and grip to the standpipe because when you stretch them out they don't you know they're not like little rubber o-rings not exactly sure what the material is right off the top of my head that they're made out of but when you stretch them out it takes them a while to decompress back down so what i usually do when i just change o-rings i'll put the o-rings on the standpipes and leave them overnight come back the next day and then install them they're very finicky about installation but i've installed quite a bit and that's the first time ever i've had a motocraft set fail on me so i'm not sure if they're just if they've changed suppliers or what this one i know has a brand new set in it as well so if it ends up being this then i'm i'm going to start deeming it down as there there's likely an issue with these o-rings and i'm probably going to go back with another set of alliance because like i said after i put those alliance in that one i didn't have issues now we're going to go under the hood and we're going to start testing the high pressure oil system with air pressure now we're ready to do our high pressure oil system testing. I had to remove a couple things so that I could get to the test port that I'm gonna use. You can hook up and do this test a couple different ways. You can hook up at the ICP sensor. You can get you a fitting to go up to an airline and you can hook up at the ICP. The only thing you're gonna have to do in that case is you're gonna have to close the IPR valve. That way it's not just leaking out into the system. So you can either make a connector and apply 12 volts to it, or you can have, if you have a scan tool, you can actually go into the scan tool and completely close the IPR valve and then do the air testing. That way is fine. I have a different fitting. I'll pop up a picture right here and I'll also leave a link in the description to where you can get one, but it's a IPR fitting to an airline. So you take the IPR valve out, put this fitting in. This fitting 
will shut off to the rest of the system. And that way, when you apply the air to it, you don't have to worry about doing anything else. The system should be closed. And then you, all you have to do is hook up to hook up air to it and listen. It's a lot more reliable, um, in my opinion, because like I said, with the IPR valve, you have to make sure the IPR valve is closed and you have to hope it's closed because if the IPR valve has an issue, then it could give you some false readings, air coming from the back. So like I said, to me, this, this method is better. And also it gives you a chance to pull the IPR valve out and look at it, make sure the screen's not blown out because your IPR valve could be stuck, you no know, damage, something like that. So anyways, I'm gonna take you guys into the hood, show you what it looks like. Like I said, the stuff that I had to remove is just for me to get to it because it is a lot harder to get to than the ICP sensor. But I removed the Ficum, I took the degas bottle and moved it out of the way. That way I could get back there into that area and work. It is a pain to get it to work in that area with all this stuff. If you really wanted to make it easy on yourself, you could remove the turbo which isn't that bad, but like I said, you don't have to do it. Um, like I said, I didn't, but it is a whole lot more tedious and requires some wobble sockets and stuff like that, some universal joints to be able to get it in there. So anyways, let's go into the hood. I have my air supply here. Don't roast me, but I don't have air in the shop yet. I mean, I really don't use that much air, so it hadn't been a priority to me. And this little tank here does the trick for everything I need, which is really just this test and using an air hammer. Not many things that I have that run on air anymore. But anyway, that's my air supply line. I'm gonna try to get back here and show you guys what it looks like in there. It's very, uh, it's gonna be kind of hard. So as you can see guys, right down there, we have my red airline fitting hooked up. That is going straight into the pump. Like I said, it's blocking off the high pressure side from the inlet side of the pump. If you have a perfect system, your system will be sealed off once this fitting goes in. If you leave the IPR valve in, the IPR valve has to be closed or else you'll just have a leak by the IPR valve. This one just makes it a little bit easier. So then all we do is get our airline hooked up. And then once we get the airline hooked up, we listen for air leaks to try to determine where we should start looking. Sometimes it can be a real pain to find out what's going on here but let's get some air to it we applied air pressure onto there it doesn't matter the pressure you can leave it on wide open uh, 90 psi 120 whatever you want this system sees way higher than that in oil pressure whatever you have just put it in there give it a couple seconds and then start listening for fitting and sputtering the sound of air coming out and wherever that is where you're gonna look like I said it, sometimes it can be very tough and you can't really tell where the air is coming from if you have like a system that's leaking in multiple spots or a really bad leak sometimes will kind of kind of hard to hear in those cases i like to use like a stethoscope to uh, put put under that way i can hear where it's loudest at and go on, go to that area once you hook up like i said if you're getting a lot of noise from the center back there obviously you're going to look at your pump area and make sure your pump's not leaking depending on which year you have stc fittings are very common on the later uh six o's if you have an earlier one you're not going to have that uh, issue you're just going to be looking towards the pump if you get noise under the valve covers like i said that'll narrow it down to you know rather than you just having to rip the system apart you can say okay it's, it's under this one in this particular case the air that i'm hearing sounds like it's coming from the rear of the passenger side valve cover area which is the most common leak that i see which comes from the standpipe is what most likely it's going to be this right here is going to be your rear standpipe it's two pieces the most common o-ring that i see to fail is this smaller one here on the upper side which goes in and seals into this piece and the lower o-ring that goes to the pipe that comes from the high pressure pump those are the most common this right here is what we call your dummy plug this goes on the front of the high pressure oil rail on the six liters i hardly ever see these o-rings fail at all especially with this updated design i can't tell you the last time i've had to change one of these because they failed when you go under there obviously replace all the o-rings in this when you take it out but i will say that the dummy plug is the least common leak, it's usually from this. One other thing, when it comes to this passenger side and the failure rate is because of how hard it is to get it in there. When you get the standpipe, you can't put it in in one piece on this side because of the HVAC box. So what you end up having to do is having to split it and put it you know, in one piece at a time and it mate, which is probably one reason why this side tends to be the most common failure point. But I will say here lately, 
I've installed quite a bit of Motorcraft ones. That's all I put on is Motorcraft. And I've had two O-rings fail. It's It's been very odd. And like I said, those of you 6 guys, so let me know if you guys have seen that out of the new batch Motorcraft, because I usually never have any trouble out of it. But for some reason, I've had two trucks to fail. So it, it's been quite odd. So I've been putting the Alliant O-rings back on them. That's what I actually have for this truck is a set of Alliant Power O-rings. And I haven't had any trouble out of those. Not sure if they're, they could be the same. Maybe I just got a bad one. It's been kind of odd because I've never really had any issues out of them. I'm gonna pull that valve cover off and we're gonna pull that standpipe out. I'm gonna inspect it. And if I find my O-ring, which I'm pretty sure, sure I will, then we'll, we'll, we'll repair it and go from there. So I'm gonna get that off, find it, and then I can hopefully show you guys a failure. And then we'll be done with the diagnostic on this truck. After you figure out where the air's coming from, if you can figure out where it's coming from, you're gonna go to that area. For this one, it was from the passenger side rear valve cover area which is kind of what I was figuring because this has kind of been a, the most common leak that you'll see and there's a standpipe back there I got the standpipe out and I got lucky that when I screwed it out it stayed in one piece and didn't separate so I then did not have to remove the oil rail I was able to get it out without moving the oil rail which saves a lot of time but like I said it's kind of just a hit or miss sometimes I'll, it'll come out in one piece and then I can separate it to get it by the HVAC box and then other times it unscrews and separates and then you have really no choice unless you have something that can jam down in there and grab the second piece but then you have to remove the oil rail so anyways on a side note we have found our problem so when I pulled the first piece separated it out out. this uh, lower o-ring uh, here I seen had o-ring material around it the o-ring this o-ring was fine but there was you could see there was rubber all around it I was like okay you know we definitely have a failed lower o-ring so then like I said we pulled the second piece out to find our failed o-ring here just looks like it just kind of blew out came apart Something about these new Motorcraft ones, they're just not doing well. I'm not sure if they changed O-ring providers or what. I'll get this up close, that way you guys can kind of see, we'll hopefully see this damage where it blew out. Because like I said, I haven't had any luck here in the last year with Motorcraft uh, standpipes. These right here came straight from the uh, local Ford dealership. They're not even a year old and they've already blown out this one O-ring, which is very worrisome. I've got the Alliant Power O-ring kit to go back on it. So we're gonna throw these back on here. I've put a set of these on, on another set of Ford O-rings that I've had fail. So we're gonna get these put on and hopefully it won't come back. I haven't had any issues out of the other one from Alliance. So hopefully they have a different O-ring provider than what Ford has right now because I've never had any issues out of Motorcraft on all the ones I've put on up until this past year. We're gonna get these O-rings on. Whenever you put uh, O-rings on standpipes, if you buy the whole standpipe from Ford and it already has O-rings on it, you should be good to go. But when you're putting the O-ring on it you need to put the o-rings on the standpipes and then you need to let them rest for at least an hour before you put them back in there because when you stretch these o-rings out to come you know to install them they're not like rubbery o-rings they don't just instantly compress back down it takes them a minute to decompress so you want to give them time because if not if you throw them on there and they're loose and you put them in the truck they're likely going to fail they, they may get cut or damaged on install if you don't let them fully decompress back down. So install these and at least wait an hour before you install them in the truck. I know for a lot of guys, it's like, oh, well, we can't do that. Well, you need to plan ahead, do it correctly, because if not, this truck will be back in your shop and you'll have to do it again. And if it's under your shop warranty, you're gonna be doing it for free. So you definitely don't wanna do that because of an install error. Like I said, these are very finicky, so you really wanna make sure that you install them right so i'm gonna get these on here and give them their time and install them back on the truck and fix this truck that's it for our installation video before you guys go i have one quick announcement we have opened up a new merch shop like i said we have the link down in the description we'll also have it on our youtube channel page we have hoodies sweatshirts t-shirts hats we're gonna add stickers at some point but we don't have those just quite yet if you guys will just go check that out go ahead and pick it up and support our channel as we're gonna make sure that all the proceeds we invest back into the channel to make Make better videos and hopefully we'll start doing some giveaways on different stuff if we get that far we'd really appreciate it if you guys would uh, help support the channel so anyways that's the diagnostics of a 6.0 no start that we have going this one we found the issue high pressure full rail o-ring for the standpipe was the failed uh, component i know this is not a completely in-depth every single scenario that could possibly cause a 6.0 to not start but this is a good basics of diagnostic and it covers most of the most common no start issues 
issues that you're gonna see on a 6.0. So I hope this really helps you guys out with your truck. If you have this issue, it may, you may even have the same issue because I will say this is the most common no start issue on a 6.0 that I see. For those of you mechanics out there that may be watching this, let me know what you guys see fairly often. Like I said, this is my most common, I would say. Leave a comment, let me know what you guys see as well. And as always, please like and subscribe and see you guys next time. Bye.